Disclaimer, if you're wondering why your favorite movie might not be on this list or why a movie that probably would be on this list isn't on this list, it might be because it was impossible for me to see everything that came out this year. These are a few films that might have made it on here had I been able to see them. I would wait, but I like to have these videos out by the end of the year, and if I feel like they'd belong here after seeing them, I'll update the list in the comments. What's up everyone? Boy did that year fly by. 2019 is one of the best years for film that I've paid attention to to be honest. I saw so many good things at Sundance, Cannes, TIFF, and everywhere in between. That said, this list was pretty impossible to put together, so this year I'm doing a top 20. Ooh la la, spicy! At number 20 we have The Climb, directed by Michelangelo Covino. Coming in at 19 is The Last Black Man of San Francisco, directed by Joe Talbot. At 18 we have Booksmart, directed by Olivia Wilde. At 17 we have Hustlers, directed by Lorraine Scafaria. At number 16 we have Jojo Rabbit, directed by Taika Waititi. Titi, and at 15 we have Uncut Gems directed by the Safdie brothers. Wait, there's more! 14 is The Souvenir directed by Joanna Hogg. Number 13 is Midsummer, directed by Ari Aster. Number 12 is Knives Out directed by Ryan Johnson. And at 11 we have The Irishman directed by Martin Scorsese. Give it up for the 11 through 20s everybody! Alright, let's get into it. There aren't a lot of films from this year that accomplished as much as Lulu Wang managed to do with 100 minutes. With certain lines of dialogue and details that feel humorous on the surface but pack a punch underneath, The Farewell is one of the best screenplays of the year. The performances from everyone involved are full of life. It comes with so much rewatchability which is crucial because I picked up so much on my second viewing. I cannot wait to watch this thing again and I can't wait to see what Wang does next. Every year there's a film where I initially watch it and I'm like, that was good, and months go by and it still feels fresh in my mind. That is most certainly the case with Ken Loach's latest Sorry We Missed You. It's one of the many films this year that deals with class struggles, and in my opinion this one deals with it in the most depressing way possible. It approaches it at an at times funny but mostly realistic way in a style that feels almost documentary. It has one of the most impactful endings of the year, and if you live in the US it'll be coming to you soon. Pain and Glory, man, what a sexy film. From the wall art to Antonio Banderas' performance, this film is rich with color. This is my first experience with Almodovar's work, and I feel like I know the man better than any of the filmmakers on this list. His life and the details and emotions he wants you to feel, the ideas he wants you to push, they are all fully realized in this film. It has a lot to say about filmmaking, drug use, sex, and art as a whole. I wish I could say more about this film, but it affected me emotionally in ways I can't really put into words. If you want to see one of the best autobiographical films this year, check it out. Where to begin with talking about what there is to love about Little Women? Greta Gerwig blew me away in 2017 with Lady Bird, my favorite movie of that year. This year she impressed me by allowing me to connect to a story that wasn't in any way close to home the way Lady Bird was. Even in moments that feel cold, Little Women is full of heart. It flows from one location to the next, one conversation to another, in a way that feels so natural, so caring. It's a unique take on the story that still remains very respective of the original text. There is an absurd amount of love coming out of this thing, it's impossible to look away. Again, while not as personal as Lady Bird, it does a fantastic job at showcasing Greta's skills as a filmmaker, and the way she can play with time, character, and more than anything, love. To those who have seen this, I understand this might seem absurd, but absurdity is what I wanted out of this film, and it sure as hell delivered. Greener Grass is, in my opinion, a top 5 comedy of the decade. It's about two soccer moms living in an extreme perception of suburbia, and it's also about a lot more than that. I honestly can't think of a lot of films who pushed boundaries with humor the way this did, who were able to make a bunch of clever and creative bits feel so natural and random. You can't really compare it to anything besides maybe David Lynch or Adult Swim, and it still feels on a planet on its own compared to those works. It might not be your thing, in fact, if you check it out after this and hate it, I understand, but if you have a free night, pop this thing in with a few friends and just let loose. You might have the time of your life. The Lighthouse is one of the most rewatchable films of the year for me. I've seen this thing three times and I'm counting down the days until I can find the time to watch it again. I love showing this thing to people and getting to see their reactions because they almost always have a lot to say about it, which is pretty impressive coming out of a film that has one of the simplest plots of the year, two guys stranded in a lighthouse. But those two men are Rob Pattinson and Willem Dafoe giving the best performances of their careers. Those performances are captured in beautiful, crisp, black and white cinematography in a one by one aspect ratio that feels like it's serving a purpose for once. And all of that is overlaid by a beautiful sound mix and score which allows for one of the most immersive experiences of the year. You can have a ton of fun theorizing what this film means, if it means anything, or you can just strap in for one of the darkest, dirtiest, and most entertaining rides of your life. My point is, I'll never get tired of watching this film. 
God damn, this movie is great. Portrait of a Lady on Fire is quiet and slow and patient, but at the same time, it's kind of chaotic and unpredictable and makes you want to scream for some reason. I haven't seen a film that feels this alive in a long time. It's just dragging you through everything these characters are experiencing. The cinematography is unbelievable. Every shot feels like a painting from this era. For how generic this could have looked, it honestly was one of the most visually interesting things I saw this year. The performances from Adele Heinel and Noemi Merlant are so real and so powerful, just seeing stills of them in the film makes me feel something. They capture a lot of small details that make these moments what they are, and when it's all thrown together, it makes for one of the most intense movie-going experiences of the year. You gotta see this thing in a theater. Avoid any of the leaks. Also, that ending? Dude, come on. Come on! I feel like if you've been paying attention to film this year, Parasite needs no introduction. I think if there was any film on this list that will be studied and used in every film school class ever, it'll be Parasite. As a lot of people have been saying, it really feels like Bong Joon-ho invented a genre with this film. It is one of the most original stories of the year, but it also gives you one of the most unique feelings of the year. By the end of it, you're kind of sad, but you're kind of happy, and you're kind of scared, and you're just kind of numb. This is one of the easiest films to recommend on this list, really. And I think that's super important, because as many people as possible should be seeing this film. It's approaching class differences in an extremely clever way that you couldn't get across through anything but film. It's clear this thing came from someone with a love for not only filmmaking, but a love for humanity. Regardless of how you choose to interpret Bong's views on the Park family and the Kim family, it's clear he understands understands both sides on an authentic level. If there's any film on here that deserves to be talked about for years to come, it's this one. And with how fun it is throughout its runtime, that won't feel like a chore. I caught Climax back in February. That's almost a year ago, and well, I'm still not over it. Climax really isn't saying a whole lot. I have some half-assed theories that I won't waste your time with, but knowing Gaspar Noé and what he said about it, I'm pretty sure it's not that deep. For those who don't know, it's about a bunch of dancers who are training, I think, and they just take some spiked sangria and they all start tripping balls. But from a filmmaking standpoint, this film has really impacted me. I've always looked at Noé's style as extremely irritating, most of the time self-indulgent, pretentious, pointless, etc. But more than anything, it's confident, it's extreme, and more than anything, it's dominant. He masters his style in Climax and has created the most hypnotizing film I think I've ever seen. It's encouraged me to check out more work from the French extremity movement, it's made me curious about the dancers in the film, it made me more curious about France in general. My point is, it fascinated me, I cannot get enough of this film. There's something weirdly liberating and kind of beautiful about finding a piece of work that can truly take control of you, that has that level of power. The same kind of power that the drugs have over the people in the actual film. A film that throws all rules out the window, cuts out all the fat, and gives you the experience it needs to be. A film that constantly mimics the dancers within the work with its cinematography that never stops moving. I mean, the technical aspects of this film are a whole other conversation and a headache to figure out how they did it. My point is, I love this goddamn film. As disturbing as it is, I think it's so beautiful. It's a perfect and masterful example of how powerful filmmaking in the human body can be. There it is. I love this movie, I really do. It took me a while to decide if this was it, if this was the film of the year and a year full of masterpieces, and at least for now, it most certainly is. The Comfort I Find in Marriage Story is up there with Synecdoche, New York, and Fantastic Mr. Fox, which Baumbach also wrote. There's something beautifully terrifying about this film, and it all comes down to the realism. I really love a filmmaker slash writer who can capture who we are as people. Not just how we talk or how we move or how we react, all of which Baumbach clearly nailed, but how we grow. How we accept change, because I feel like while marriage, divorce, relationships, etc. may not always be relevant, your growth as a person will always be there. Your contributions to those around you, the way those around you contribute to you, it's always there, and this film is recognizing that in the most beautiful and painful way. The editing is genius, I have a whole video on it. Adam Driver gives without a doubt my favorite performance of the year, digging into some of the most personal and ugly places a person can get to. And as much as I don't like Scarlett Johansson, she undeniably killed it too. And how can I talk about the performances without mentioning Laura Dern? Jesus Christ, I love her! I could go on and on and on about Marriage Story. It truly is one of those films that'll stick with me forever and that I'll be constantly referencing in my own work. But for now, I'll leave it at this. When you take a step back and just look at the filmmaking on display in this film, it's undeniably the movie of the year. And that's it. If you want to check out the full ranked list, the link is in the description. But aside from that, thank you all so much for a fantastic year. I had a lot of great experiences thanks to you guys' support. I have a lot of cool things coming up next year. I cannot wait to get them out. But for now, thanks for sticking around. Check out all these films and form your own opinions. Uh, check out my podcast, and I'll see you guys in the next year.